And that brings us now to tonight's keynote address. And this is from Dr. Kevin Roberts. Kevin, as I'm sure all of you know, was named president of the Heritage Foundation in 2021. And he has led an incredible reinvigoration of that venerable institution. He came to Heritage after serving as chief executive officer of the Texas Public Policy Foundation in Austin. And it was while he was at TPPF that I first met Kevin. This was back in 2020, those dark days when our country seemed to have lost their minds and said that we all needed to be shut down and, and stuck in our houses and put weird mouth diapers on our faces. And, uh, and, and by the way, if you want to read more about those dark days, please read the current issue that's on your chairs. Our own Helen Andrews has a great retrospective on all the horrible things that were done to us then. But back then in 2020, we at TAC were supposed to host a book event for Rod Dreher's newly published bestseller, Live Not By Lies. The only problem, though, was that that book event was scheduled for California. And of course, the COVID, COVID lockdown insanity was really centered in Gavin Newsom's state. So we weren't able to host an event there, and we had to scramble to find another venue for our event. Now, I knew that Texas was a free state. They had a dynamic conservative think tank in Austin, and we had some mutual connections with TPPF. So I approached Kevin about TAC hosting an event at their headquarters, and he was incredibly welcoming to us. He was gracious and helpful throughout the whole thing, and as anyone who knows Kevin Roberts knows, that is entirely within his character. So when Kevin was named the next president of Heritage just a couple years ago, I was thrilled not only because he had been friendly to us at TAC, but because I knew that this was someone who understood that the conservative movement is a coalition and that we are most effective in turning this country around when we work together rather than against each other. So this is the spirit that he's brought to Heritage, perhaps most notably in the ambitious Project 2025 presidential project that's something that we at TAC are proud to be a part of that seeks to unite and leverage the resources and knowledge of the conservative movement to serve the next conservative president. Kevin has been incredibly kind to our magazine. He has frequently published op-eds in our pages. And on a personal, personal note, he has been incredibly, an incredible counsel to me as well in leading this organization. We are honored to have him here with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kevin Roberts. Thanks, Emil, and thank you all for having me. I think you, in spite of all your wisdom, Emil, selected the wrong keynote speaker. I think that was already Ambassador Matlock. Another round of applause for that great national treasure. <clears throat> all of us here, sir, will remember those remarks for the rest of our lives. Thank you and your staff for your heroism. God bless you. And Michael Knowles, you're not bad yourself. Great comments. Congratulations, my friend. <clears throat> Let me say to all of you that the American conservative, of course, has flourished. It will continue to flourish. But I would be remiss if one of my best friends in this business, Emil Doak, is not recognized one more time. Hats off, Emil, for a job well done, and God bless you. <clears throat> And, and I'll, I'll get to it, but one last group of people considering what the ambassador has said and, and what Michael covered and what I'm about to talk about, which ultimately is in the spirit of what I call a fraternal correction to friends in the movement. If you are a veteran of the armed forces, please raise your hand or stand if you can so that we can recognize your service to this country. God bless you. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here. And to be honest, it is a little intimidating if I think about those of you who are here following wonderful remarks by the ambassador and by Michael. You see up here, as opposed to being at individual tables or in certain corners of the reception, I get to see the whole rodeo. And you're an impressive lot. And those of you who are at the beginning of your careers are impressive. Basically, as I scan the audience, I'm looking at a neocon's worst nightmare. <laughs> so 
So I know it's late, but it's great to be with you. And I'm hoping that there are members of the Wall Street Journal editorial board here so that they can learn something. Game on. In fact, I don't think there has been such a collection of common sense, populist, nationalist, conservative guts and intellectual horsepower in this room since my hero, Pat Buchanan, dined here alone. It is an honor, in turn, to honor the men and women who have made the American conservative the indispensable journal to the conservative movement. As you know, you, yes, they deserve a round of applause. As you know, tonight's program has already showered thanks and praise on tax founders, its masthead, its writers, all of its staff, its outgoing leader, its board, and with good reason. The American conservative's first issue in October 2002 came at a time that was fashionably called the end of America's holiday from history. Today we know that moment is better understood as the middle of the American right having a holiday from conservatism. A generation hence, it must be said, the globalist ideological hubris that overtook the Washington Republican establishment at the end of the Cold War and still dominates elite institutions today was wrong from the beginning. It was never strategically sound. It was never recognizably conservative. It was never something that had a mandate from the American people. And it never overcame its inexcusable blind spot for and indifference to the struggles besetting working American families. And I'm here to issue the fraternal correction. It must also be said, including with some humility by me, as a recovering neocon, and now president of the Heritage Foundation, that for the last 20 years, there has been one major institution on the right consistently driving us back to our conservative roots, the American conservative. It's a testament to tax intellectual rigor and tenacity that in the last few years, the ideas of international realism, constitutional sovereignty, and economic patriotism have leapt from the pages of a bi-monthly magazine to the very center of American politics. No publication has so driven the national debate or won so many converts this past year. None has guided so many conservatives home to the principles and people our movement has always served and fought for. But even as we celebrate and thank TAC for its unprecedented successes these past 12 months, I come to this gala tonight not simply to praise the TAC family, but to challenge it. You know, I do so as a friend and as a supporter. And as I have written in TAC itself, I do as someone whose own misunderstanding is about the proper national security approach found his way largely because of consistently argued positions in the American conservative. Thus, my challenge is not for you to change what you're doing, but to do more of it. Because I believe the most important work this American conservative effort ever does will come in the next 12 months. From Ukraine to Israel, from the southern border to Iowa, New Hampshire, from Brussels to Belgium, from big tech to small towns, America's trajectory for the next decade and maybe the next generation will be set in motion before tax next annual gala. The same issues that for 30 years have tempted the United States to abandon its founding values and vital interests will reemerge with greater force than ever before. The same voices of globalism, elitism, and materialism that squandered our victory, sorry, Ambassador, in the Cold War, and severed the sacred bonds of trust between Americans and their government will again try to smear, marginalize, and demonize dissent, especially from the right. In these coming fights, it will not matter that the American conservative was, as its tagline says, right from the beginning. What will matter is whether tax writers, editors, and contributors are ready to help lead the post-neoconservative, post-globalist, post-corporatist, post-libertarian American right that TAC helped create. That the conservative movement has taken the long way home to ideas this magazine has espoused all along is a vindication to be sure. But it is precisely in moments of vindication 
that we are most vulnerable to the pride and complacency that threaten everything that went into bringing out those moments in the first place. We know this first as students of human nature, but we know this too as observers of our own movement over the last 30 years. Those same temptations will soon confront the populist nationalist right as it finally takes its hard-won place at the head of the conservative movement at this uniquely dangerous moment in history. Success then requires the men and women in this room to see this moment, not as victory or vindication, but as an opportunity. The opportunity that generations of conservatives have fought for so long. It is an opportunity that may never well come again and which we cannot afford to miss like our generation of leaders did plunging us into three decades of decadence, debt, and defeat in spite of the sacrifices and heroism of all of our men and women in the armed forces. <laughs> Remember just how this story began. In November 1989, when the Berlin Wall came down, President George H.W. Bush's approval rating hit 70%. Soon it would reach 80 and even 90%. I remember the news journals being astonished. In November 1991, Saturday Night Live aired a skit about prominent Democrats smearing themselves in a debate parody titled Campaign 92, the race to avoid being the guy who loses to Bush. Yet a little over two months later, a syndicated newspaper columnist named Patrick Buchanan won 37% of the vote against the president in New Hampshire's Republican presidential primary. <laughs> Buchanan's Granite State ambush was immediately dismissed by the press and the establishment as a fluke, the so-called death rattle of an old backward conservatism of the past. Little did they know that it represented, in fact, the first breaths of a new forward-looking conservatism of the future. As a young man living in Louisiana at the time, I knew this full well, having volunteered for his campaign and having volunteered for the largest campaign event for him in the country that year. Perhaps that correlated to him getting the highest percentage of the vote in any county in the country in my home parish of Lafayette, Louisiana. But I'm not here to take any credit. The official narrative of the 1990s says that it was driven by personalities, Bill and Hillary Clinton, Newt Gingrich, Al Gore, Monica Lewinsky, and the rest. But the superficial partisan soap operas of that era obscured and distracted the public from tectonic shifts in federal policy that upended our national life. All of them were shamefully bipartisan. That's right, I said they were shamefully bipartisan. Wield power when you have it. And most of them deliberately excluded the American people from providing meaningful input and accountability. First, there was President Bush in the lead up to the first Gold War, Gulf War, unilaterally declaring a new world order to be governed by the United Nations and policed at its behest by the United States Armed Forces. There was the North American Free Trade Agreement, which gutted America's industrial Midwest and lit the fuse on an illegal immigration bomb still exploding to this very moment. The next year, another treaty created the World Trade Organization, wherein Washington surrendered America's economic sovereignty to globalist bureaucrats, just as our working class community stood to cash in their share of the Cold War peace dividend. Not that peace was on their menu. In 1993, Clinton sent U.S. troops into Mogadishu to referee the Somali Civil War to infamous results in the Black Hawk Down debacle. He orchestrated a bombing campaign over the former Yugoslavia. All along, Clinton and his Republican counterparts on Capitol Hill turned most favored nation trading status with communist China into a bipartisan article of faith. And all along, the voices of America First nationalism, economic patriotism, and social conservatism were ignored, dismissed, or belittled. The same Washington establishment that celebrated serial predators in the Oval Office and the United States Senate condemned America First conservatives as being beyond the pale. And all of this was before George W. Bush and his team of neocon mediocrities 
and their dog-eared copies of the Weekly Standard <laughs> as they strutted America into the successive catastrophes of Iraq, the financial crisis, no child left behind, the Great Recession, and then the presidency of Barack Obama. Less than a generation since middle American hard hats and homemakers delivered the West's greatest international victory since World War II. America's economy, democracy, culture, prestige, and confidence lay in ruins. Just as Buchanan conservatives had warned all along. In his speech announcing his rogue presidential campaign in 1991, Buchanan implored the Republican Party we call for a new patriotism where Americans begin to put the needs of Americans first. When we say we will put America first, we mean also that our Judeo-Christian values are going to be preserved and our Western heritage is going to be handed down to future generations, not dumped into some landfill and multiculturalism. At his convention speech the following summer, Buchanan implored his party, there is a religious war going on in this country. It is a cultural war, as critical to the kind of nation we shall be as the Cold War itself, for this war is a war for the soul of America. <clears throat> he and conservatives around the country warned of the raw sewage of pornography before the internet. They warned of illegal immigration before NAFTA, and of the China shock before we poured trillions into a weaponized rival economy aimed right at our middle class. They questioned the Iraq war and were declared traitors for it. On every major policy dispute in this era, populist nationalist conservatives pleaded with the Republican establishment to remember who and what they were supposed to defend. And at every turn, Washington elites sided with Wall Street, K Street and Silicon Valley and against the working men, women, and communities who comprise the party they led. This ends on a happy note, but I'm not done. And so today, our nation is beset by unprecedented crises around the world and of course here at home, along our borders, on our crime-ridden streets, and our gas, grocery, and utility bills in our toxic and atomized culture, in our exploding national debt and falling birth rates and life expectancy, in our empty churches, fatherless neighborhoods, failing schools, and overflowing prisons and mental health facilities. The bad news is neither the Republican Party nor the conservative movement nor the American people can take mulligans on any of the failures that have led us here. But the good news is we do have the opportunity now to learn from these mistakes as we work to forge a new governing agenda, a new coalition, and a vision for America's future. This work is essential on its own terms. Mandates should be earned, not counterfeited. But it will also answer, once and for all, that most insidious of all the slanders the establishment hurls at conservatives. Not that the ideas are wrong, nor even that we ourselves are deplorable, Rather, the cowardly, self-righteous lie that populist, nationalist, anti-establishment conservatives are uninterested in governing at all. That we don't have an agenda, just a grievance. That we are a nihilist peanut gallery content to criticize the swamp's yes-men in the arena from the safety of our backbench caucuses, think tanks, and magazines, one magazine in particular. Just because this slur is false, doesn't mean, however, that we should ignore it. On the contrary, we ought to obliterate it. If the Republican establishment really thinks we can't produce a positive agenda or lead the national coalition they have misled for 30 years, get out of the way and let us get on with work. <laughs> Conservatives, now armed with our dog-eared copies of the American Conservative, Stand ready to meet them anytime, any place, on any issue they please. And is it no coincidence that merely asking questions, merely asking questions, causes the establishment to go into a tizzy? Just ask another American treasure here tonight, my great friend Bridge Colby. Round of applause for that great American. <laughs> Bridge 
a preview of the hopefulness in just a few moments is we are witnessing. We are party to the death throes of an establishment whose death is long overdue, and we get to be part of it. As the presidential primary of 2016, the speaker's races of 2023, and the clear direction of legislative and electoral momentum on the right demonstrate, we are in the fight and already doing more than simply holding our own. This shouldn't be the surprise it apparently still is to official Washington. After all, our vision for America's future, the American conservatives' vision, is and always has been America's vision too. The American people never asked for NAFTA. They never asked for the WTO. They never asked to import illegal immigrants or export manufacturing jobs. They never asked to surrender our sovereignty to the Supreme Court, to the administrative state, or international organizations of anti-American frauds and bigots. They didn't ask for same-sex marriage, for boys playing girls sports, for defunding police departments, corporate bailouts, or a woke war against America's history and heritage. These ideas if you think about it, were never proposed in open debate. They were imposed behind closed doors because leaders in both parties know all along their vision of elitist authoritarian globalism could never have won a mandate from the American people. Ours can, it has, and it will again. For ours is a vision of peace in the world, freedom at home, sovereignty under our constitution, and solidarity with our fellow countrymen. We reject the default tyrannies of collectivism and cronyism favored by the Washington Uniparty. We demand a government that serves its people, not just some of them and not the other way around. To those skeptics in the Republican Party who declare our values outside the boundaries of acceptable Reaganism, I would remind them of Reagan's words at his 1980 nominating convention, describing the GOP as, quote, a party ready to build a new consensus with all those across the land who share a community of values embodied in these words, family, work, neighborhood, peace, and freedom. The American conservative and those in the conservative movement are ascending not because of our vibes, but because of our values. We are inheriting the party of Lincoln because we embody the spirit of Reagan. It is precisely Reagan's spirit, humble, patriotic, loyal to quote ideas over ideology and principles over party that we will need to lead our coalition and nation effectively to succeed where a generation of Reagan's successors frankly failed. Ironically, the substance is the easy part. We don't need to start from scratch to develop the agenda that will help realize our popular patriotic vision of 21st century America. The American conservative has for 21 years hosted the constructive conservative policy debates that Republican leaders mostly ignore. Policy shops like the one I run are already working with elected leaders like Senator J.D. Vance, Senator Mike Lee, to turn these proposals into policy. And we welcome more of them to Washington. A more realistic national security policy is not rocket science. Just watch my colleague Rob Greenway on TV. All we need to do is reorient our international strategy toward our national interests. A generation of American globalism has made our world more dangerous and our nation less secure. Consider, Europe is at war, the Middle East too, Asia is dominated by a genocidal totalitarian superpower, now making strategic inroads in the Western Hemisphere, aided and abetted by some of our own policymakers. Migration crises are destabilizing five continents. Yet the institutions that were supposed to manage our new world order spend most of their time and budgets shrieking hatred at Viktor Orban, at Brexit, and of course now our Jewish brothers and sisters. Spare us, please, any more establishment platitudes about norms or about a rules-based order, whatever the hell that is, and definitely any more UN or my favorite EU resolutions. In this moment, it's the party of the status quo that is reckless, dangerous, and extreme. And yet, true to form, 
This crowd who in 2003 read Iraq skeptics out of polite society are now trying to do the same to anyone who asks what America's strategy in Ukraine might be. In lieu of presenting such a plan, President Biden and Leader McConnell want to tie U.S. aid to Israel to yet another blank check to Kiev. But I have good news on this front of national security realism. In spite of all their bars, all their name-calling, all their intellectual dishonesty, all their fear-mongering, and all their finger-wagging, they're losing and we're winning. The reason why is obvious. The American people are on our side, and they always have been. Consider, for example, President Reagan's wisdom, dare I say, populism, in his January 1989 farewell address. He said, ours was the first revolution in the history of mankind that truly reversed the course of government and with these three little words, we the people. We the people, Reagan continued, tell the government what to do. It doesn't tell us. We the people are the driver. The government is the car. And we decide where it should go and by what route and how fast. As Reagan would remind us if he were here tonight, to govern is to choose, and once again, Washington is choosing not to serve the nation's values, but to leverage them against our own values. Frustrating as uniparty globalist mischief like this may be, we must remember that it's not a perpetual motion machine like entitlement programs or teacher union contracts. As we saw under President Trump, national sovereignty and national security can be corrected and quickly to make our nation stronger and safer. It really is just a matter of political will. So too is economic reform. If presidents from Bush to Biden found it easier to make globalist policy unilaterally through treaties and regulations, so too is it easier to unmake them in the same way. With strong conservative leadership, China would never see another dime's worth of American investment, consumer spending, or access to our markets. Every American oil rig worker, Thank you. Every American oil rig worker, my people, quite literally, could be back at work tomorrow, and every woke busybody in the federal bureaucracy could be fired. Should have been Paul Dan's clapping first, but we'll see. The southern border could be secured and sanctuary cities and states defunded. Critical race theory could be, shall we say, canceled at American schools, government agencies, and in our military. In other words, a president could, in a single afternoon, leave unfavorable trade agreements and sovereignty sapping international organizations. The federal government that has so far, for so long, put its thumb on the scale of big business, big banks, and big tech against working families could finally remove that fat thumb getting out of the way of the plans, dreams, and initiative of everyday Americans. And despite the establishment's shameful inaction, there is much elected conservatives can do to use the power they have to heal America's cultural rot as well. Again, remember that the public stands with us and against elite lethargy and indifference. On pornography and big tech's conspiracy to addict our kids to screens and smut, on drugs and crime on our streets, on the sexualizing and grooming of children in our schools, on parents' rights and girls' and women's safety, on freedom of speech and religion, on the Second Amendment right to self-defense, on the need for more and better options than a bachelor degree from Woke U with $60,000 in student debt. We can revamp the welfare and tax systems to stop penalizing marriage, kids, and stay-at-home moms and start incentivizing them for the benefits they provide to society. The Heritage Foundation is proud to work with TAC on these major issues through Project 2025. Some of you know this story, but all of you should. Informed by five decades of the mandate for leadership, Heritage set out to create a program of goals, policies, individuals, and programs for the next conservative ad administration based on three initial observations. First, that the magnitude of these challenges we face requires a transition plan larger in scope than anything we've ever done before, because what we're confronting is larger in scope. Second, that a project this large could not, 
and frankly ought not, be the product of a single organization. Heritage could coordinate, but Project 2025's work required a real coalition of partner organizations almost as large as the conservative movement itself. We're proud to say that this coalition has grown to 75 plus strong, a true representation of our movement. And third, we knew that if we wanted Project 2025 to succeed as a political and also an intellectual endeavor, one of those partners had to be the American conservative. So once again, to Emil and your staff and your board, thanks for being a vital part of Project 2025. To close, to close, if, if the policy battles ahead are the easy part and this moment of opportunity for the right, the hard part will be staying true to the ideas and especially to the people who got us here. Going forward, conservatives who are so accustomed to being ignored by the Republican Party will increasingly be in charge of it. Just witness the D.C. swamp political chatter in this city trying to make sense of Speaker Mike Johnson. It's a glorious time in the nation's capital. With that success will come temptation, however, complacency, entitlement, and hubris. That is the story of the last generation, how our own leaders sold out our republic's Cold War triumph for a mess of globalist pottage. But it's not the end of the story. And in the long arc of history, it may end up being only a footnote. Every day, more conservatives are turning their back on the leaders who betrayed them and returning to the fold, joining this fight against the Marxist left and the globalist elite. You see, the right is not lost. It never was. It's just taken the long way home. The long way home is how Pat Buchanan described his own endorsement of George H.W. Bush at the 1992 Republican Convention in Houston. His speech, which I cheered on from the convention floor as a college freshman, wearing um, a less than legal convention credential. <laughs> I think statute of limitations have gone, but hell, that doesn't matter apparently anymore. <laughs> In that speech, the comments, the substance were mischaracterized as declaring a culture war in America which everyone in America then as now knew he was only describing as a war well underway started by someone else. A war of choice, in fact, launched by the left and the GOP elite against the working families their new world order would leave behind. The decades that followed saw Republicans win control of Congress and dominate it since. They won the White House twice and even finally secured a conservative majority on the Supreme Court. But look at our nation, and at our world. Winning elections simply isn't enough. Neither is simply being right. There are no referees handing out awards to conservatives when we win Twitter debates against woke fanatics or Republican insiders. It's fun, but there are no awards. The great task remaining before us remains to bind up our nation's wounds, to rescue her sovereignty, our constitution, and the rule of law to restore her social solidarity and economic opportunity, to secure our borders from an illegal invasion and our culture from woke theocrats and globalist usurpation, and to do it all with the grit and the humility few successful political movements ever sustain after tasting political success. That is why the American conservatives crowded hour is still ahead and why the new populist nationalist conservative movement it helped create needs its flagship journal more than ever. And we know there's no institution or publication more able or thank God more willing to tell us the hard truths we need to hear when we least want to. Like its founding editor, Mr. Buchanan, TAC has made its mark in the world by being a thorn in the side of elites who badly deserved one. As TAC ascends to its moment of opportunity and influence, it will need that same friendly thorn, that same filial correction, that same honest, incisive analysis. Just as the political establishment lost our trust over the last generation, this magazine has earned it. Through each issue, through each fight, 
and especially through each neocon barb and establishment purge. We reached this moment for one reason. They were wrong and you were right. The establishment already proved the first point. Soon, we will have the chance to prove the second. We can, and I believe we will, as long as American conservatives stay true to the American conservative, and the American conservative stays true to itself, its vision, and to us. Together, we can show our movement and our country that the long way home was just the beginning of the right way forward. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you.